Without urgent action to protect families, the number of children living in monetary poor household could soar up to 117 million in 2020. These are just some of the many devastating statistics that have emerged. The COVID-19 crisis has already exacerbated root causes of some of the biggest threats to children's survival and well-being, hunger, poverty, and reduced access to health, education, and protection services. We cannot afford standing by and observing such levels of suffering unfold. That is why we are here this week, to prepare ourselves to prevent as much as possible and to respond to child protection harms that will result from the COVID-19 crisis. Therefore, a warm welcome to all of you, practitioners, academics, donors, and policymakers who have joined us online today from all corners of the world. And welcome to colleagues who are watching over the live stream. We're delighted to have you all at the 2020 Annual Meeting for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. This year, we will certainly miss our face-to-face -face interactions, but it is impressive to see how technology has enabled us to expand our ability to host many more of you than we could have if we were meeting face-to-face. -face. We are expecting up to 1,000 colleagues in this meeting. In particular, we have many more field-based colleagues joining us, including from national and local organizations. Just to give you a sense, Last year, we were able to host about 10 colleagues from national and local organizations, while this year, we expect almost 200. That is a 20-fold increase. We particularly like to welcome our colleagues from national and local organizations who have joined us now. We wanted also to start by recognizing the difficulties that most of us have been dealing with in the past few months due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We had to deal with the emergency and the consequences of the health measure personally and professionally. Being a parent, a nurse, a teacher, a counselor at home and working around the clock to ensure that the most vulnerable children remain protected. Bravo to all of you for having made it this far. Thanks to support from our donors, particularly the US government, SDC, as well as UNICEF and UNHCR, we were able to hire a company, Rhys McCann, in collaboration with BASIS, that specializes in online events. They have helped us reimagine the design of the annual meeting in a way that will be engaging, rich, and fun. We believe you will find this event to be different from most other online events you have joined so far. Last year, around the same time, many of you were in Geneva for the 2019 annual meeting. The theme of that event was humanitarian development peace nexus. During the same event, we launched the 2019 edition of the minimum standards for child protection in humanitarian action. This launch couldn't be timelier. It is interesting that at the time, we didn't know how consequential the discussions of that annual meeting would be. When the COVID-19 hit the world stage, we were ready to support child protection practitioners in part because the 2019 edition of the CP minimum standards had incorporated guidance on responding to infectious disease outbreaks. Also the discussions on the humanitarian development nexus had prepared us for a crisis that would affect humanitarian and non-humanitarian context alike. As of late February, the Alliance had formed an interagency task team to start working on COVID-19. By the time WHO declared COVID-19 a pandemic, we were ready to release our first technical note on protection of children during the coronavirus outbreak. We went on to produce 10 additional annexes to the technical note and hosted almost 30 technical webinars on different topics throughout the past six months. Many of you or your organizations generously contributed to your expertise and time to this process. The reward is that these technical material are being used by practitioners in the field. The technical notes produced by the Alliance have been downloaded over 120,000 times in the past six months, only from the Alliance website. This is a testament to their relevance and quality. When it came to deciding about the theme of this year's annual meeting, the decision was not too hard. COVID-19 has so drastically increased a multitude of risks to children 
while hindering our ability to effectively protect children that we naturally gravitated towards dedicating this annual meeting to the topic of infectious disease outbreaks and protection of children. This means that while we will be talking about COVID and its short and long-term impacts on children, we will also be spending time talking and thinking about future infectious disease outbreaks that unfortunately will likely occur and will continually continue to affect children negatively. We invite you all to give this meeting your full attention. Avoid multitasking or scheduling other meetings as much as possible, please. And bring your ideas to share and also an open mind to listen and learn. This annual meeting is going to be unforgettable. You will get to meet new people and learn about how colleagues have been protecting children in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. While during days one and two, we will hear from our colleagues about how they protected children. We look forward also to day three, which is dedicated to infectious disease outbreaks and protection of children. In other words, we will be reflecting on how we could better position the child protection sector and develop a plan that would support practitioners in responding to infectious disease outbreaks. On day four, we will dive into the priority setting process. Three years have passed since the Alliance for Strategic Plan. So much has happened and was done during this time. And please, let's not forget the amazing work led by the Alliance Working Groups and Task Forces. There will be a chance on Friday to meet them all and learn about their work a little bit more. We want to take this opportunity to thank all of those who have been and continue to be involved in the organization of this event. Our presenters who have submitted high quality abstracts and to our facilitators, you are the pillars of the next five days. We know that most of you are doing this on top of your day jobs. Thank you for your hard work and your positive energy throughout the process. To our working group and task force leads, thank you for your leadership, your hard work and your commitment to the Alliance and the sector. Many organizations as as well are contributing to this event in kind. And this event would not have been possible without all of them. A special thank you goes to UNICEF and Plan International, the, go the co-leads agency of the Alliance. And finally, thank you to all of you, dear colleagues, who have been working so hard to protect children despite challenges and adversity. Nous espérons sincèrement que vous apprécierez cette semaine avec nous et nous sommes impatients de nous engager davantage avec vous. Profitez bien de cet événement. We sincerely hope that you will enjoy this week with us and we are looking forward to engaging more with you. My name is Hani Mansourian, co-coordinator of the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. Enjoy the rest of this event. And my name is Audrey Bollier, the other coordinator of the Alliance. And now we are very honored and pleased to welcome Mrs. Gillian Triggs, the UNHR Assistant High Commissioner, for her opening remark. Please, Mrs. Triggs, the floor is Thank you for that introduction. Hello, everybody, and welcome uh, to participants from all over the world to this first ever fully uh, virtual annual meeting of the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. I very much enjoyed the uh, welcome remarks and uh, we'll certainly hold you to your promise that this is going to be engaging, fun and unforgettable. We have uh, some very important things to talk about. Uh, representing UNHCR, uh, we are very honoured to have the opportunity to open this meeting which does bring together so many practitioners, leaders, policymakers uh, to consider how best to protect children, but most importantly for this session, to mitigate the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on some of the world's most vulnerable. And this meeting provides a very special opportunity to show how together globally we can respond uh, to the need to strengthen child protection. Well, you might ask, why UNHCR? Why refugees? Why would they be given an opportunity to speak so early on in this, uh, this five-day uh, conference? And the answer lies in, in the figures, uh, some of which uh, Audrey has given us. But the figures are unprecedented and, and huge in relation to children. 
uh, UNHCR has reported that we have something in the order of 80 million people who are either refugees or who are displaced in their own country. But over 34 million of these refugees and displaced people are children. And in terms of refugees alone, 52% are children. It's clear then that when we're thinking about the impact of COVID-19, children displaced and children who are refugees are in dire need of our support. Of course, we do know that children can be remarkably resilient when they're properly uh, supported and protected. But sadly, they're particularly vulnerable to the social and economic and other consequences of the pandemic, but also to the impacts of displacement by conflict, by environmental disasters, and of course, infectious diseases. Children then have not really been the face of this pandemic as they're not as severely affected as adults, but they may in fact prove to be its biggest victims. They have been directly impacted by lockdowns that have led to all sorts of family disruption, loss of jobs, evictions, and sadly, domestic violence. Protective norms under international refugee law and standards are being undermined. Economies are struggling and education systems have been disrupted on an unprecedented scale. The pandemic is a global crisis, but it's one that compounds or builds upon many other crises. And as many of you will know, rather better than me, the, the, the facts in relation to children are, are, are quite shocking. Um, before COVID-19, every five seconds, a child under the age of 15 dies. 20% of children are thought to be, or as estimated to be malnourished, and 25% of children under five do not have their births registered. The longer the current crisis, the more dramatic the impact on children will be as economies falter and inequalities widen. Well, as I've suggested, one of the great uh, or most pervasive impacts of the pandemic is the vulnerability of children and the disruption of their education. It's thought that at its height, 1.6 billion children, including tens of millions of refugees and internally displaced children, uh, will have uh, lost uh, access to schools. Uh, for refugees and IDPs, particularly secondary aged uh, girls, the impact has been cataclysmic. The data modeling done by UNHCR and the Malala Fund found that 50% of refugee girls in secondary education may not return when classrooms finally reopen. Sadly, rolling back all of those gains that have been made over the last few years. The closure of schools also deprives many girls and boys of basic social and psychological support, of course, access to child protection services and to many school programs that provide meals on a regular basis. The longer schools are closed and the deeper the economic contraction, the greater the likelihood of dropouts from schools. In some countries like Ethiopia and Pakistan, fewer than 10% were enrolled at all in secondary education, the fear is that those girls will never return. Well, in addition to those elements uh, in relation to education, we also have very concerning figures that suggest that up to 66 million children will fall into extreme poverty as a result of the pandemic. And it, that adds to 386 million children already judged to be in extreme poverty last year. The great tragedy is uh, that this will affect children in the short term and also in the long term. Another element of the impact of the crisis for children has been that they've been subject to much greater levels of violence. And of course, not having access to protection services has exacerbated the problem. The lockdowns and the confinements have led to violence, in including gender-based violence against children and it's limited their options to seek assistance. Caregivers, women and girls in particular, are vulnerable to violence. And families, of course, are breaking down in, 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 in these times of lockdown. Since the pandemic started and quarantine measures were put in place, calls to hotlines for domestic violence have substantially increased all over the world, from 20% to 150% in some countries. Recent data, for example, from India, 
shows a 30% increase in calls to child helplines related to violence, while a national assessment in Bangladesh indicates a 40% increase in calls. The pandemic has created conditions that increase the exposure of children to conflict, including uh, conflict uh, with armed forces, uh, bringing children into recruitment into those groups, uh, as well as subjecting them to further abuse and sexual violence. Movement restrictions also limit the ability of children and their families to seek refuge, and it's also separated children from their families or caregivers and made reunification more difficult. We've also seen very high levels of stress and anxiety by children or in, in, uh, on behalf of children uh, as a consequence of their disruptions to family life, to friendships and to their normal and daily routine. Well, that's, that is a grim, a dire picture. And, and, and uh, there is more, I think, uh, to see over the coming weeks and months. The question then for UNHCR and for the Alliance is what are the solutions? What can we do? Well, it's fair to say that many countries are managing their borders, both to protect public health, as is their responsibility, but also respecting the right to seek asylum and for children to have access to education and health uh, services. In fact, it's been one of the encouraging aspects of our work at UNHCR that we have observed that most nations have understood the need to ensure that children are included in national health uh, and education systems. Local communities, as the first responders and often the best place to know the needs of local communities, are stepping up to protect and support children and finding ways to combine remote and face-to-face -face services in innovative and effective ways. And indeed, one of the um, silver linings, if one could put it that way, of the COVID pandemic has been our growing confidence in technology and our willingness to use technology to reach numbers of people that we've never been able to reach before. And as I think Audrey has pointed out, uh, even this meeting is one which has been able to reach out now to people in the field, in operations, and to bring them into this discussion. And I think that's a huge advantage um, as a consequence of, of COVID that we have learned how to use remote, these, uh, remote technologies. Well, one of the very important contributions that can be made to protection of children in this pandemic is the uh, work that's been done on the minimum standards for child protection in humanitarian action. UNHCR and the staff uh, have contributed to the uh, revised version in 2019, and we hope that there will uh, be an increased use of those standards, particularly for the kinds of uh, advocacy that is so important to protect children. Um, advocacy, of course, for the standards, but also advocacy to return us to the core principles of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, a convention that virtually every member of the international community, as states, um, is party. We also would like to suggest that technical support to authorities to implement COVID measures uh, should be done in a way that mitigates especially risks to children while also protecting public health. For example, essential child protection services should be recognized as life-saving and should not be suspended during lockdowns, quarantines, travel restrictions should also include provisions for families to be reunified and for children to return to school. We also urge the expanding of partnerships with local communities. As I've said, they are very often best placed to understand the urgent needs of children and we need to respond to those commun that community wisdom and that community support. Uh, UNHCR has been um, very much engaged in developing cash assistance programs, which has um, been a response to COVID, but has proved to be effective already in reducing the vulnerability of children to child labour. But perhaps above all, and one always uh, returns to this problem, protecting children costs money. It requires adequate funding. A shortage of resources for humanitarian operations can have a devastating impact on millions of people, but putting women and children at particular and heightened risk. Vital services such as child protection, support for survivors of sexual and gender-based violence, access to education, water, sanitation, and hygiene activities may be canceled or at least scaled back if more funding is not forthcoming. So I conclude really with by saying how core 
child protection services are, how important it is to fund them adequately, to use uh, advocacy, to use the standards and the child protection, um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the convention on the rights of the child to underpin our advocacy and ensuring that we have the funding to keep these services going. So in conclusion, thank you very much for, for allowing me to speak at the beginning of this meeting. Um, it is a unique opportunity to strengthen our collective vision of resolve uh, and capacity uh, to protect children. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mrs. Triggs, for being here with us today, for having um, provided us with those inspiring reflection, uh, which I think is gonna help uh, setting up the scene for, for this meeting. I quite like your way forwards and the opportunities that we can all seize, um, whether it is engaging more with local communities or reflecting on use of technology, as well as obviously um, supporting our work thanks to the child protection minimum standards. So a deep and sincere thank you for your presence with us today. And I'm gonna turn now to Hani Mansourian, the other coordinator of the Alliance. Hani. Yes, thank you, Audrey um, and, and Mrs. Strix. Um, we are going to have um, six panelists on this panel now. Um, we will have Dr. Najat Mala, Mala Majid, um, Yasmin Sharif from Education Cannot Wait, Cornelius Williams, um, Dr. Michelle Yao, Alison Sutton, and Dr. R Roberta Pertucci. And the bios are going to be pasted into the, into the chat box. You can also find them either in Kiko chat on the right side, you will see a, a space that says speaker bios or on our website. Um, on the, on the webpage that relates to the annual meeting, you will find all of the bios of speakers of the opening panel, as well as um, speakers throughout the week. So I, I cannot see the rest of the panel on my, on my screen, um, but I believe they're all here. Um, so I'm going to start by inviting um, Dr. Najat Mala Majid, Secretary General on violence against children to introduce herself briefly and also tell us about the, mo the most significant learning that she has had from COVID-19 pandemic so far. 90 second, seconds, please. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I am Najat Malamjid. I am the special representative on ending violence against children. And um, very, very quickly, what I learned that uh, I start one year and uh, one month, and after three, six months, I faced, you know, this pandemic. What I, what I learned from this pandemic is that it's not only a health crisis, but it's a more wide crisis, and it's becoming more and more a child rights crisis. And another lesson learned that we have really to see uh, building back better after this pandemic, really as a key opportunity to really stress child protection as a key priority and to see uh, investing in children's pro in child protection as a key 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 investment in recovering back thank you dr uh, majid um, i would like to invite yasmin sharif uh, the director of education cannot wait to also introduce yourself please and provide uh, significant clarity thanks Good morning, everyone. Good, good morning from New York um, and good morning to Nairobi and all, all the world um, participating um, today and this week. Um, my name is Yasmin Sharif and I'm the director from uh, education of Education Cannot Wait. And as many of you know, because we're working very closely with you, especially you are out in the field, uh, we are a global fund for education in emergencies and pro child crisis. And we were established by the World Humanitarian Summit in 2017. Um, what have we learned from this crisis? Well, you know, our job is to mobilize resources and political support for education. And um, with that, I would also agree to what Gillian has said earlier, and, 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 and uh, is that uh, education 
uh, is also protection. Or we are not only faced with the health crisis, we are also faced with the protection crisis. As a matter of fact, every crisis is a protection crisis. With its health, with its conflict, with its displacement, there's always um, a strong protection centrality. And uh, in response to COVID-19, always bearing in mind the, the emphasis on protection, Education Cannot Wait was one of the first responders uh, to um, uh, COVID-19. Uh, already in early April, uh, we mobilized support. We unleashed our entire emergency reserve. And as of this date, we have dispersed $60 million to 33 countries in crisis to reach, reach um, children and adolescents. Uh, whose education were disrupted by COVID-19. And we shall continue to scale that up and, and work with all of you to make sure that we can make a difference during this difficult time. Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin, for that strong message. Um, I would like to invite Cornelius Williams, Associate Director and Global Chief of Child Protection with UNICEF, uh, to introduce yourself and share some thoughts. 90 seconds. Uh, thank you very much. I think actually you've already introduced me. I'm Kennedy Williams, Associate Director of UNICEF and Global Chief of Child Protection. I'm happy to be here today, actually as a practitioner of 30 years. And what has been the most important for me was to see the agility of the child protection sector, as you have mentioned, in bringing together and developing guidelines technical notes, uh, programs actually, that was contextual to respond to the pandemic. And this would not have been done, okay, without the alliance. The alliance repositioned itself. It already had the assets to do it. And they crossed, they made the cross the humanitarian and development nexus. Without these assets, actually, uh, the development partners would not have been able to move together so fast, actually. So the universal nature of the crisis has meant that whatever asset was there was used by the Alliance, was used by the child protection sector, and we need to commend the Alliance for actually um, the way they have been repositioned themselves, actually, and serve the sector. Back to you, Heidi. We'll move on to um, to Alison, Global Director of Child Protection, Save the Children. Alison, over to you. Hi there. Yes, now I, I'd like to echo um, Cornelius' words about the pivotal role that the Alliance has played in bringing experts and practitioners together to draw on the fundamental child protection minimum standards and adapt guidance for safe programming to meet the challenges of COVID-19. Um, but for me, as an, in an operational agency, the most significant learning from the pandemic has been <clears throat> that the necessity is the mother of invention. And we've just seen so much rich adaption and innovation in the field to achieve child protection continuity that draws on both the, you know, draws on and feeds into the global guidance that the Alliance has been promoting. But that, you know, that you can move things quicker and better when everyone pulls together, driven by the urgency of need. And this is full spectrum. We've seen it in highly developed, developing and humanitarian contexts. Um, and that given the scale of the crisis, it's necessary to reach children, families, communities, professionals and policymakers with clear and useful information to empower them to act. And the Alliance podcast is an example of that. Um, but it's, it's just showing that it's possible to convert messages, guidelines, training materials into more easily digestible formats for the transfer of knowledge to where it's most needed. And then finally, that you know, it, we have to work across sectors to ensure that every single actor is aware of the risks children face to their protection and well-being, and to be alert and capable of identifying and referring them for substantive responses and echoing Jasmine, that we need substantial investment in those responses and uh, also with Najat, putting children at the center of building back strategies. Okay. Thank you very much, Alison, for that. Um, and uh, last but definitely not least, Dr. Roberta Petrucci, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, pediatric advisor, advisor and leader of the International Pe Pediatrics Working Group. Um, MSF. Over to you, Roberta. Good afternoon from uh, Geneva to everybody. Again, I'm Roberta Petrucci. I'm a pediatrician. 
and I work for Médecins Sans Frontières as leader of the International Pediatric Working Group. So supporting population during emergency, especially related to epidemics, is at the core of our medical action. And we acknowledge the imperative and the difficulties that the global health community is facing to continue responding appropriately to this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. This said, the direction that this response is taking has potentially devastating effect on child health, some of which we are already observing and have been explained quite clearly from my colleagues that talked before me. So we are extremely concerned because what we're witnessing on the field is that while COVID outbreak, of course, it's today the global priority, other essential activities, health activities are being constantly downscaled, even in areas where fewer COVID cases are present. And this seems to penalize particularly children and their families. So we see reduced access to healthcare. Uh, we see it every day in many emergencies, of course. It's not new, but the size and the length of this outbreak puts at risk years of positive evolution on child health, on the control, especially of conditions such as malaria, malnutrition, other vaccine preventable disease that are likely to spike due to the reduction in treatment and preventive activities. So what we are learning is that the decision that we make during this period will be crucial in mitigating the negative impact on child health and well-being, both during, but also especially in the aftermath of COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm very glad to be here with you to discuss this panel today. Thank you very much, Roberta. I will uh, begin by asking a question um, to Dr. Majid. Um, sustainable Development Goals, Goal 16.2, gave a new life to the long-standing fight against violence against children. As the SRSG for Violence Against Children, your office is at the forefront of this fight. How do you assess the impact of COVID-19 on violence against children, Dr. Majid? I just, uh, many thanks, uh, Hani. I just want to remind very uh, quickly that before we saw the COVID-19, <coughs> uh, we were not really, uh, we were very far on being, you know, from being on track on achieving the SDG 16.2. We have no, never to forget it. The violence was, was affected estimatedly 1 billion of children worldwide and the vulnerability of children were, was increasing worldwide. The COVID-19 pandemic, you know, really poses specific challenges to ch children protection from violence with the poorest and vulnerable children hit hardest. As was highlighted by uh, Julian Twiggs, we see an increasing violence against children, such as domestic violence due to confinement measures, due, due to restriction of uh, movement, but also disruption of child protection services that were already weak. And uh, another point that is very important, the children were, could be victim of violence, domestic violence, but also could be witnessing, you know, experience violence. And we, we know that it's very impacting. Another forms of violence is also the widespread digitalization that make more and more children connected and facing more and more risk on being, uh, you know, victims of violence against children. And we, Europe all highlighted in their recent reports that they see an increasing online, uh, you know, uh, activity from sexual predators. Another point that is important and we are not highlighting also that we see because also of the security approach, uh, you know, increasing in many countries, we see also arrest, detention and the excessive use of force against children because by authority when enforcing emergency measures. I want to highlight also the impact that the COVID pandemic had on mental health. And this is very important to highlight because of anxiety, because of uh, insecurity, because of uncertainty. And we know really that adverse childhood experiences can have devastating in immediate and long-term uh, effects on the mental health of children. And also to highlight within the mental health that also the COVID-19 poses uh, really serious challenges to children who already have mental health difficulties because of the closing of many, many services. And another point that I want to highlight is also the access to information. During this pandemic, we saw that children really will have many, many difficulties to have access in a child sensitive and appropriate manner that impact not only their mental health, but also how they can reach, you know, uh, child protection services. And uh, uh, the main point is regarding the socioeconomic impact 
on COVID, and it was highlighted by uh, Julian Twiggs, the increasing of extreme poverty, the increasing of food insecurity. And we know that children who are already vulnerable before the pandemic, such as children, uh, poor children, children from minority background, asylum seeker, refugees, internally displaced, children living on the street, children with disabilities, children deprived of family care, children deprived of liberty, children living in conflicted area or humanitarian settings are more and more at risk to be victims of violence. And we know that the risk of poverty and social exclusion is a driver for various forms of violence that will increase, you know, sexual violence, trafficking, sale, child labor, child marriage. These far-reaching consequences, this will be my last word, really calls for prioritizing, you know, child protection in the current response and the post-pandemic response. Over to you, Hani. Thank you very much, Dr. Njit, for, for uh, reminding us of the, of the difficulties ahead in, in achieving 16.2. Um, and preventing and ending violence against children. I would like to uh, turn to uh, Yasmin and ask you, Yasmin, you have always been a believer and an advocate um, of the intersection between child protection and education. You also referenced it in your, in your opening remarks. Um, and you see those as essential for children's well-being. Um, at the height of the school closures due to COVID-19, there are different accounts, but one account says 1.3 billion children were out of school. This may have been necessary to help slow the spread of the virus, but how do you see the impact of these school closures on learning and well-being of children, Yasmin? Thank you very much. Um, I, I would like to build on Najat because she has outlined all the protection challenges that children are facing as a result of, it's not just COVID-19 per se, but the consequences of school closures that has led to, 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 the, to the violence that she outlined in detail. Uh, so to build on that rather than repeat it. And, and conversely, schools, when they are open, they are an enormous protection mechanism for a child or an adolescent uh, in school age. Uh, they keep them engaged. They take them out of their homes or their camps. Um, they receive school meals. Uh, they have tools to be educated academically, but also socially uh, and emotionally. And uh, they, they can get access to good hygiene. Um, uh, and of course, the physical and the mental health um, can be better accommodated in an education or a school environment. And I, I would like to point at Norwegian Refugee Council's a recent study for the Middle East where 88% of children are now affected by um, toxic stress, trauma, depression as a result of COVID-19 and the closure of schools. So, and, and just imagine when, when a school is all that you have and you are a refugee or an internal displaced, you're in Central African Republic, in Afghanistan, in Mali, and all you have is the school that hopefully can provide that holistic approach and suddenly all of that is taken away from you. And on top of it, the family have lost their income. And that's where cash assistance is very important. And there may also be a lot of, um, um, I would say emotional and violent um, uh, impact in families, um, which also subject the children and the adolescents to more violence as a result. And then staying in that environment rather than being in a school. And most of all, I should say that today because it's the, it's the World International Day for teachers, losing that mentor, losing that sense of protection that the teacher also represents to the children. Um, so, so that's why we are, we, are, we are concerned, of course, and I'll take that in my question too, as to for how long these school closures can last uh, and, and the enormous long-term impact it will have. It has been said before that, that, um, that it, once a child or a young person leaves school as a result of school closure, most likely they will not return to school. And as we can see, COVID-19 seems to be much uh, more long lasting than had been expected at the outset in March or, or February. And as a result, we will have 
a, a protracted out of school situation, uh, which will reduce the number of um, uh, children and youth. And, and uh, as the Malala Fund uh, study pointed out, at least 10 million girls may never return who were already um, 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 uh, in, a, in a difficult situation prior to COVID-19, but still attend the school. So there are going to be long-term impacts to keep a child out of school uh, or an adolescent as a result of school closures, mental, psychologically, academic, um, social, um, and also the entire protection from the violence that Najat outlined. Um, such as um, gender-based violence, uh, child labor, um, sexual gender-based violence, and, and the mental impact uh, on, on, on children and forced marriage and early child labor, you name all of that. So um, when you're in a crisis situation, uh, one needs to think twice before closing a school, no matter what crisis come upon um, a child or a youth. Uh, or a community or a country. And to conclude here, uh, it is therefore important. Um, education is life-saving. It's also a development sector that cannot be withheld from children and youth because they are in a crisis. We need the SDG4, we need development also in a crisis, even more so, because it, it means protection and it also means um, paving the way for the future here and now, rather than postponing it until the conflict has ended 20, 30 years down the road and a whole generation have lost their education. So it's, it's not just a health crisis, it has enormous impact on how we invest in the future generation, in their growth and their ability to survive the multiple crises that are impacting them now, conflict, displacement, COVID-19, and the enormous violence and protection threats that are part of their daily life in a crisis or in a refuge. Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin. Um, very uh, sobering again. Um, I would like to invite um, Cornelius to the next question, and I, and I would like to invite all of the panelists to keep your, please keep your um, responses to, to about two minutes, uh, just to make sure that we don't run over too much. Um, Cornelius, UNICEF has, has been the, is, is the lead agency on, on protection of children, a UN lead agency on protection of children, and it has significantly contributed to protection of children in infectious disease outbreaks since its formation. Ebola and COVID are not. Um, how do you think the, this pandemic has been different and how has it impacted the sector of protection sector's ability to continue in its work of protecting children? Over to uh, thank you, actually, um, Fanny. Uh, first, there are two things that make this pandemic different. It's the scale and the severity of uh, prevention measures. In terms of the scale, every country and every economy has been affected, and it has an ample effect on child protection, as has been said by Najat and Yasmin. Um, what we see, actually, is that uh, the the economy has been affected, it is, the systems have been stressed, and in addition to that, it has spotlighted the universality of increased violence, abuse, neglect, and exploitation in times of stress. So nobody can say they don't know now about the exploitation and violence that children face, the mental health impact on children. It's all there on the media, virtually every day, in every country, right? We, the sector, must seize this opportunity and to see how we can, we can turn this into a structural change to address violence against children. And if we want to look at scale, as I said, it's scale and uh, preventive, preventive measures. In terms of scale, uh, some of it has been mentioned. 40 million children miss out on our <laughs> right? Uh, 1.1 billion uh, children and youth are still out of school. Um, to, uh, it has already been mentioned, actually, that uh, Malala Foundation and the UNHCR that yeah, yeah, yeah. 20 million girls would never go back to school, right? In terms of the severity of the prevention measures, this lockdown measures that we all know about, and the combination of some of the risk factors which other colleagues have mentioned, 
of children being confined at home, the shock and the economic stress. What we know, okay, is that actually from the UNICEF and Save the Children report, that over 150 million additional children will be plunged into poverty. And we know that actually for every 1% of child uh, poverty, increase in poverty, 0.7, around 0.7 would move into child labor. And the impact actually on the ability of the sector to work in this condition, right? How has it impact on the ability of the sector? We have analysis that shows that child protection services have been disrupted in more than a hundred countries. Home visit by social service worker and justice workers in 65 countries. Registering your children, civil service, uh, registration services, 42 countries. Legal and judicial processes for children, right, in 40 countries disrupted. And in the humanitarian settings, the girl safe spaces, as has been mentioned, has also been disrupted. Let me uh, quickly to round up, actually, let me show four ways in which we've adopted, ad adapted to this. The remote case management, which we are now doing, right? Uh, the social workers as an essential service, government declaring social workers an essential service and providing them with the personal protective equipment. The child helpline, which has been mentioned by the opening speaker from UNHCR. And four, actually, the adapting ways of de delivering uh, positive parenting. And in, in addition to that, actually, in a, a few, just a few issues, actually, to round up. We've also seen two innovation. Let me just mention two innovation and finish on that. In 40 countries, actually, they have released over thousands of children from detention, which was not possible. These were children in conflict with the law. This was not possible before, right? And then in terms of mental health, we have done it in a very participatory way, as it has been said. I mean, you, the Alliance was part of the release of the storybook, My Hero, how kids can fight COVID. Now, 1,700 children, parents and caregivers and teachers contributed to that story. So it was done in a very participatory way. Back to you, honey. Uh, Al Sam, while you lead the child protection efforts for, for Save the Children, you have been a big advocate for social protection in the response to COVID-19 pandemic. What, ev what evidence do we have um, of the impact of, uh, of, of COVID-19 on protection of children that relates to the issues, um, issues of social protection? So the social and economic impacts of, we've just heard in great detail, the, the social and economic impacts of COVID-19 on families are affecting children's, not only their vital access to nutrition, health and learning, but whether they're exposed to violence, child labor, child marriage, other forms of exploitation. Um, from the Save the Children Global Survey, we identified that 77% of households had suffered income loss, with that rising to 83% of households where there's a disability having lost more than half of their income. At the same time, we also saw how this, um, together with confinements, are increasing stresses in the home. So, for example, one in five children in households with income loss was reporting violence occurring in the home against adults and or children, as against one in 20 in households with no income loss. So social protection not only addresses monetary poverty, but ultimately aims to overcome social vulnerabilities, including gender inequalities, which we know have vastly exacerbate, been exacerbated in this crisis. And social protection is one of the largest social sectors within government programs, often working at a national scale and provides a unique opportunity for child protection sector to leverage results for children. During COVID, we've seen almost all governments have undertaken some kind of final fa family financing support, although not necessarily reaching the most vulnerable. So therefore, allying child protection expertise to social protection and cash programming can support reaching those most vulnerable to violence, exploitation and neglect. But we urgently need to bring child protection expertise on risk and prevention to inform the design of social protection systems. There is a growing body of evidence across both humanitarian and development contexts that clash 
plus inventions, uh, interventions, linking social behavior change communications to social service workforce and complementary services can improve the protection and appropriate care of children. Sister organizations like IRC that co-leads the Alliance Cash and Protection Task Group have brought forward country examples to the fore and also highlighting the need for safeguarding elements of social protection cash program to be safe for women and children. So child protection actors need to be both an, a reliable entry point for social protection support to the most vulnerable families and an effective referral mechanism for the quality services to overcome those identified protection risks. Thank you, Alison, for, for all the information and also for your advocacy on this, on this very important area. Um, Roberta, um, I wanted to ask you um, about the, the implications <laughs> of the terminology that we use. So infectious disease outbreaks are often dubbed as health crises or public health emergencies. What do you think about this terminology and the implications that it can have in looking at the response in a multi-sectoral and holistic manner, in particular considering vulnerabilities of children? So thanks for the question. Luckily, not all the infection disease outbreak lead to health crises or public health emergencies, but when they do, it's important to acknowledge it, to highlight that the consequences on population and communities go far beyond the crude disease toll. Therefore, even in the implementation of outbreak, if, even if, if the implementation of outbreak control measure is essential, the response must be much broader and specifically focusing on the most vulnerable part of the population, notably the, the children. So as the problem goes behind the disease itself, the response cannot only be medical or related to public health measures. We must be able to think in an holistic manner and on the long-term consequences on the physical and mental health of people. So it's becoming pretty obvious, we have been saying it since the beginning of this meeting that the most dangerous threat to child health and well-being in this pandemic, it's not the disease itself, but all the extended indirect consequences, even in areas, uh, geographical areas that haven't been hit by COVID. And that's the most uh, frightening part of it. So while most resources and efforts are redirected towards the COVID response, we observe the downscaling of pediatric services, community-based activities such as ICCM, routine vaccination, but also say delivery, newborn care, and not to live outside adolescent health. We are also seeing that due to fear and misunderstanding, families avoid health facilities altogether, meaning that sick children are being kept at home, resulting in, in extra significant risk of morbidity, as well as unnecessary deaths. A more insidious effect that we see from the health perspective is the increase, of, and that you've been discussing, describing very well, is that we see the increased occurrence of child abuse, neglect, and exploitation as the essential infrastructure and resources are reduced, while supporting programs and, and schools are closed. So if we want to, to mitigate these risks, and we must do it by acknowledging that it is a crisis, it's not just an outbreak, and we must ensure as far as possible access to care and protection, continuation of preventive activities, and the use of health promotion and get engagement strategies. And I think that the core of it is to empower communities to be part of the response and not just the object of the response. Over to you, Annie, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Roberta, for that. Um, it actually just jogged my memory of the statistics that I, that I saw recently. Uh, uh, it's estimated that 1.2 million children could die, and under five children could die from lack of access to health services due to COVID-19, not due to COVID-19 itself, exactly. lack of access because of COVID-19. Uh, and that's 1.2 million children and under five alone. Yeah. Every day, yeah. every day in all our projects. And that's what we're right. really fighting for. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to go back to, to Najat. Uh, if I may, Najat, as countries continue to fight against COVID-19, what measures do you think need to be put in place uh, to ensure that the prevalence and severity of issues of violence against children does not worsen significantly in the next few months or, or possibly years? I will be short because many things were already told, but I want to highlight the main points. Uh, as I was highlighting in the beginning that the far-reaching consequences uh, of this crisis uh, due to the mitigation measure, but also the 
upcoming you know uh, impact regarding the social economic impact but also the impact on the government budgets that will really have a lot of risk regarding you know delivery of services and mainly for children we need really to make sure that child rights really to health including mental health to education and protection has to be prioritized in the pandemic response and recovery planning this is very important and to see this as an investment you know also for the economic recovery post covid and also paying attention to the most vulnerable and among them all children living in humanitarian setting but also all the list of vulnerable children i provided before i think what is important we need to ensure that the lessons learned on the violence related aspect of the first lockdown and second and third are integrated into emergency emergency preparedness no including the development of protocols for service delivery and the protection of children we need to see you know this phase of building back better after the pandemic while we are currently in the decade of for action of the sdgs uh, 2030 as an opportunity for governments worldwide to reassess priorities and really seeing advancing human development, reducing inequalities, especially for children, must be a major investment. The, we need all of us, as we are commemorating the 75th anniversary of United Nations, and it's about multilateralism, we need to advocate very, very strongly and mobilize and make this movement, you know, to protect children more, more strong and more, more worldwide, and also to have more and more commitment and ensuring that the economy recovery packages must include first child protection services that has to be recognized as life saving and essential services along with health mental health and education as part of an intersectoral and child rights based response second a solid social protection system including universal grants and universal health coverage that will protect children and their caregivers from economic risk third this cannot be done without children perspectives and views and without involving children as part of the solution in the current and recovery phase of this pandemic this requires us to provide empowering pathway for children to become drivers of change with particular attention to the most vulnerable children. And I think my last word is really to see building back better after, after the pandemic as an opportunity also for us as child rights, so you know, activists and uh, defenders to see how we can really strengthen our collaboration, how we can really mobilize not only at global level, but at regional, at local level with and for children to make really children duly protected, empowered and seen as critical uh, agents and paying very strong attention to the most vulnerable to make sure that no child is left behind. Over to you, Annie. Thank you, um, Najat, for, for that, those strong messages, particularly of putting children themselves at the center and, and hearing their voices and giving uh, value to their agency. Um, thanks, Najat. Um, Yasmin, I want to come to you and ask about um, how you think the lessons that we are learning today about the school closures and how they're impacting children could inform future um, responses to infectious disease outbreaks, because unfortunately this may not be the last one. Could share your thoughts on that please i think first of all is i think and everyone is saying it so eloquently so i don't want to repeat i think it's a it's a very articulate panel but education is a protection mechanism and when you have a crisis um, you do not remove the protection mechanism you actually increase funding attention to those available protection mechanisms are in country we are speaking here the pre-COVID-19, we have 75 million children, of whom 39 million were girls uh, and uh, 13 million refugees. And these numbers are increasing as a result of school closure. Uh, but do not remove the protection mechanism when you have a crisis or an escalating crisis with multiple crisis elements. That's the first lesson learned. Rather, and this is, this is for any crisis, and we have known this for decades, you have to be creative to find solutions 
to keep moving in the midst of crisis. You cannot stop being active, stop delivering. And, and here, when it comes to education, being life-saving, look at what we, we have learned, not only from this crisis, but from the Ebola crisis. But there's a, you can train the teachers. Give them the training for how to manage the hygiene, the, the psychosocial uh, impact. Uh, invest in, in building bigger uh, classrooms. Um, invest in more technology where it's applicable. And I have to say, in most sub-Saharan Africa and many other countries in Asia who are affected by conflict like Afghanistan and so forth, you don't have access to technology. And that has to do with social economic inequity and lack of infrastructure. So don't rely on technology only, but build the bigger classrooms, make sure that all education facilities have sanitation, have uh, hygiene, teachers are trained, there is, there is availability for, or, or space and scope for social distancing. I have two messages. One is for all, we, we know that as a result of COVID-19, Many NGOs have had to scale down because the funding is not available. And the same goes for UN agencies and education cannot wait. Our job is to mobilize those resources for UNICEF, for UNHR, for WFP, for Save the Children, for Norwegian Refugee Council, for PLAN, for so many national NGOs and help them do the implementation on the ground because they are doing the real job. So my, my recommendation is one for all the NGOs and UN agencies and, 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 and cluster coordinators keep reminding humanitarian coordinators who are also resident coordinators to ensure that education is a priority when they plan for COVID-19 response and post-COVID-19 and for all the, the, the donor partners who are with us today please ensure that your allocations to the COVID-19 response and the post-COVID-19 response places education as life-saving. That is also part of the humanitarian development coherence. Use your humanitarian envelope and your development envelopes come together. That's what humanitarian development coherence is all about. Invest in pooled funding so that we at education cannot wait, can empower and support all our colleagues, NGOs and UN agencies on the ground uh, to deliver to the 75 million plus uh, children, youth um, uh, and adolescents um, whose education is disrupted during the crisis and make sure that they can return to school as soon as possible. Their education cannot wait. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yasmin. I really like that kind of image of when when you have a crisis of protection, you don't take away that, that very protective environment that you have for them, of course, considering all the health elements that are out there. Um, great, I would like to go to Cornelius um, and ask you, Cornelius, what do you think needs to happen to place children and their protection at the heart of the continued response for COVID-19, as well as future infectious disease outbreaks? I think I have two points I'd like to make here, or three points I'd like to make. One is what Roberta has said. We now know that we have to recast what is public health emergencies. They need to go back to the drawing book. It's there in some of their theories, but they need to now apply it in practice. That a narrow focus on breaking the transmission, right? and the medical response has had really damning consequences for children, okay. So, and the issue is, it's going to set back decades of investments and gains that have been made in pushing the SDG achievement. Worryingly from far from rich. So as this is the decade of action for the SDG, it is very worrying, right? That we have not actually have a holistic approach that takes into consideration the mental health, the protection, the education, the livelihood, this cannot be separated. And we need to focus on the family as the center, right? With these children and their society. It's now becoming clear, the role the family plays in education, mental health, you know, right? I mean, and care of these children. The second issue is social protection, which Alison spoke about. 
We know that over 200 countries have planned social protection work with 1,000 actually social protection measures planned or in place. However, there is little data for refugees and children and displaced population. We need to look at those marginalized population. Uh, Najat mentioned it. This is the time to right inequalities, right? This is the time to right inequalities. And so these social protection programs should ensure that they are universal and address these inequalities. In addition to that, it should not only be monetary poverty they're looking about, they should look about the multiple deprivation and to ensure that child protection is linked to the services. Let us not have two parallel systems that is looking at vulnerabilities. It should be holistic. The final one is the evidence. The sector has to increase its investment in data, research, knowledge, management. I've been impressed at the speed, okay, and the agility and the rapidity of the sector actually in documenting some of the lessons learned. But again, as Najat says, these lessons learned have to be integrated in not only into the preparedness, but into the building back. We have to see these lessons in the national response plan, in the HLPs, in the RLPs, and we have to see the budgets in these HLPs, RLPs. And again, we can only do that with the support of all the development partners. And my last point is, let us make this a movement about human capital. That is the next generation who are going to power the economy of this world. And remember, we would fail in our SDGs if we don't make them the center of any response. Back to you. Thank you very much, Cornelius, uh, especially for a couple of the points that you made, the, the, the issue of families, investing in families and supporting them, and the holistic nature of the response that is that is needed. Thank you. Um, Alison, also Cornelius mentioned social protection, so it, it uh, flows nicely. From social protection perspective, what, what do you think uh, needs to happen in the next months and, and years, possibly, to counter the devastating impact of COVID-19 on children and their families? Um, well, I mean, th this whole future question is one that is also for the participants in this annual meeting, and so it's going to be really interesting to get their inputs. And I wanted to sort of look at three aspects. So <clears throat> the meeting background document um, it gives us some really important guiding questions about working across the socio-ecological framework, which to me, and echoing um, many of the previous speakers, listening to children, breaking the silence on what's happening to them and connecting them to peers and services, equipping families with financial and parenting supports to help get their children back to learning, support their mental health and be able to live their childhoods, mobilize communities to identify and support mo those most at risk, and then very strongly invest as societies in putting child rights at the center of their recovery policies. Um, then the second important point is the, the background document shines a light on the need to accelerate localization, ensuring that resources and support are available where needed at community level. And the child protection sector has been a champion of localization and needs to continue to drive this, overcoming some of the current limitations on resources and support reaching local organizations. And finally, and here brings in the, the question with the, the, the interface with social protection, we must bring all sectors together to more effectively achieve outcomes for children's rights, uh, protection and well-being. So in today's context of shrinking resources, we need to ensure that interaction with families, be it by community health agents, teachers, or through access to cash programming is sensitive and responsive to child protection risks. We need a strong child protection sector and the message that social service workforce, both formal and informal, should be designated as essential and supported to safely provide essential services is loud and clear and we will continue to make it. But we also need to ensure that all sectors assume their obligations to protect children, to include indicators on this and to track them. And within the humanitarian sector, of course, we have uh, to give a child's face to the centrality of protection. And, um, and in kind of working all that out, we, we've, we've got the next few days where we hope that all the different examples and expertise gathered here will bring color and richness to these challenges. 
I'm just going to move quickly to Roberta because we're really running behind now. Um, Roberta, how do you think the lessons of COVID-19 can help us place the holistic needs of children and their families at the center of response to future infectious disease outbreaks? Over to you, Roberta. Thanks. So the current outbreak is actually showing us harder than ever that if we want to be able to respond to appropriately to disease outbreaks as well as other public health crises, the key for success is preparedness. And it's quite obvious that we were not prepared to this outbreak despite the fact that it was somehow not completely a surprise. So preparedness must be prioritized at many levels, but what we have been learning over time is that preparedness is strictly related to the resilience in uh, communities. So the more we invest today in empowering community to take responsibilities of their own health and well-being, the more ready and effective we will be to respond to the current crisis, but also to the, to the ones to come. Communities know their priorities, they know their potentialities and their limits. Technical guidance and support are essential on what, what to do when it comes, for example, to best protective measures or best clinical management during an outbreak. But community's involvement is key to adapt, prioritize, and find effective communication strategies. We need communities, especially the ones in precarious condition, but not only, to build up their resilience, the resilience by investing in the well-being of children and their families through child-friendly and child-centered services, especially regarding school, nutrition, immunization, healthcare, and protection, without forgetting that the sense, of course. And we need to provide practical support to parents and caregivers on how to manage mental health first aid during a crisis for themselves and their children, and tools to help support learning even when schools have to be closed. We need to announce community networks for protection of children and adolescents. And I think the COVID pandemic altogether is set to exacerbate existing inequalities and children will be among the hardest hit. So we need to work today to reduce the short and long-term consequences by creating more resilient communities that can also respond better to future crises. Over to you, Johanny. Thank you very much, Roberta, for those messages, particularly the preparedness and also investing in communities um, that have been at the center of this response. Um, we do have a lot of questions that are coming in. Um, Unfortunately, we won't have the time to get to all of them, but I'll quickly try to pose a few and we'll try to get answers from the panelists to the rest of the questions for you guys and post it uh, during this, this event. Um, one question that has come in, it's not to anyone specific, it asks uh, that we sp speak a lot about coordination um, and the need to design and implement, and implement joint programs to reduce protection risks for kids. COVID has highlighted this need and yet we struggle. What needs to change? And several of you mentioned multi-sectoral collaboration and coordination. Um, Korn, you mentioned it, Yasmin, um, Najat. Um, so if any of you wants to come in and, and suggest some thoughts of why are we struggling in, in actually co coordinating and collaborating across sectors? Yasmin, please go ahead. Thank you very much. And I think it's an important question. I am sad that the question is being asked because it shows that we still have a long way to go. Coordination should happen either between the coordination cluster or in situations of refugees under the oversight of uh, UNHR. And of course, always together with the host government. And it's on these premises that education cannot wait is investing in joint programming where education investments have a strong protection component as, as a part of our top priority. So it needs to take place within the cluster or under the auspices of UNHR and always with the government uh, in the lead. If this is not happening, then it means that we are still working in silos and competition is, is taking over coordination efforts. But I can say that education cannot wait using this mechanism, have invested in 33 crisis countries today, mobilized $650 million that are continuously uh, invested in all our partners on the ground, UN agencies, and NGOs with a strong uh, influence and design and implementation by communities, by children and, and by um, uh, local actors. So it does exist. Learn more about education cannot wait. 
it's there to help us all coordinate better through joint programming, humanitarian and development actors, and, and bring optimal results on the ground. Uh, and may I say, we are part of the UN system, but we are also there for the civil society. Um, and, and they are among our absolute uh, key actors on the ground. But Education Cannot Wait can offer some answers. So read up on us. We are happy to respond to questions bilateral as well. Thank you. Great, thank you, Yasmin. We probably will we'll take you up on that because there are actually several questions specifically to you. So we'll, uh, we'll share those with you and it would be great if we can provide some. Anyone else wants to say anything about coordination before we move to the next question? Nedjad, please. I think this is a main important uh, problem, you know, worldwide regarding coordination because we are all of us pushing for how this multi-sectoral coordinated approach. But I think in a practical way, this is very difficult to implement, to be very frank. And we saw it in many places because what it's important when we are speaking about joint implementation, we are also speaking about not only joint responsibility, but also individual responsibility. This is very important also to have a kind of, you know, accountability mechanism because we uh, commit and after when we need to deliver, it becomes very difficult. We need also to make sure that when we are, we are not fighting and it's not only about you and you have also, as you were highlighted, highlighting Alison is the local level when children are living and growing. This is very important, how you can make sure that in the same time you are coordinating, empowering and building Building this chain of services, you know, around children and the community. And the main important point, I think, is really to clarify who is going to do what, when, and also to have a kind of timeline and, you know, reporting and monitoring and in a transparent way. This is very important to be very context specific, to be very humble, to learn from the other and to learn more and more, you know, assess our coordination and our impact by children themselves and the community. This is very, very important to make. We need, for example, I just, it will be my last word. We have within all of us to make sure that all this guidance, technical note and so on and calls that it's a huge amount, how it's really uh, reach the local level. We have no idea. We have really to be very careful about what we are doing and also to criticize ourselves regarding, you know, how, what is the meaning of coordinating and coordinating for me, it's also, Accountability. It's very important uh, to take uh, to bear in mind. Over to you, Annie. Um, panelists mentioned the need for additional funding and resources, but global economies have been affected, and may, maybe this will impact funds for humanitarian action. Um, what can be done, um, or what can we do as a as a child protection global community uh, in this in this context? Child protection as a group, and um, we have to make the case. Right, of the investment. We can no longer appeal on the basis of child rights or on the basis of emotional appeals. We have to make the case. Now, one of the cases actually, and we should also remind the world that there are duty bearers and child rights, but one of the cases that needs to be made is that we cannot afford a lost generation. And this is going to have an impact on society, right? You know, on the economies in society in future. If these kids um, are not um, educated and don't get the skills, and we know actually from analysis that have been done, the cost to an economy of children who have been abused and children who have suffered violence. It costs the economy in terms of the social services, the lost productivity, et cetera, et cetera. The mental health, the same thing. So we should be putting this together and reminding policymakers and those who have the decisions over the project about the impact if they don't make this investment. Thank you very much, Cornelius. It's absolutely important that investment case. Um, great. Next question. Um, in the political world of adults, children are left behind. How can we ensure children's voices can really influence decision makers and policies that affect them during and post COVID-19? Uh, I, I just want to uh, really, uh, this is the main important point, it's uh, regarding about child agencies, children agency, and this is really important. How we make, may, can make sure that children's voice are heard, I think it's so it's the 
concepts and the uh, how we understand child participation and we have to start by ourselves this is very important we if we see children as actors we have to treat them also as partners and to systematize child information access to information child consultation child involvement this is very important what does it mean is to is to stop having this one one shot you know meetings and after forget this is the main point another point what we saw currently is that children are really taking worldwide wonderful initiative during this covid you know civic engagement and it's also how we can bridge and channel and make aware all the key stakeholders at local level but also at regional and global level aware of the, all this action another point also i think is also how we can involve them and here it's important and taking into account the representativity to make sure that we take into account the geographical representativity the gender representativity but also the vulnerability representativity this is very important and it's up to us to do it and the last but not the least we have to be accountable when we are listening when we are hearing when we are collecting information we have to come back and to institute and to explain to children what we did and to involve children in monitoring you know all our action because they are so more pragmatic more concrete and they can provide us with wonderful solution really to correct and to move forward anyone else wants wanted to come on this I, I mean it's just so yeah it's just so but, but you know Jean was just so eloquent about it so i think just you know she she's such a champion and it's it's so fundamental and we see in our you know when children are organizing and they are supported and and you know what a difference it makes so just to echo um the need to be more systematic in the way that we have continuous processes that actually result in changes in policy and in feedback and in the actual lives in the in the way that children have agency in their families in their communities not just in the sort of political fora how we manage to keep it the whole chain working absolutely so not and avoiding tokenistic um participation which which unfortunately sometimes takes place um last question that i'll ask um we have heard a lot about challenges and negative effects on children any positive or resilience factors that have shined to you have one in addition the the global survey that save the children did with you know very large numbers of children and caregivers across um you know 46 countries there was just one one of the pieces of evidence was was just really striking about looking at well-being and looking at whether children were more sad or more less hopeful that the difference between children having contact with their peers either directly or virtually was you know from having 54 percent of of negative um you know impact to when they were in contact with their peers and their and <clears throat> either directly or virtually coming down to five percent of negative feelings you know that that's such an important thing that we need to invest in and obviously through the schools opening but also through giving those opportunities for children to meet to play and to um you know support each other uh, we had many uh, you know uh, reports that were done and survey current during this pandemic you have made from various ngos you have hashtag covid under 19 you have plan you have save the children you have a lot and i think what it's important currently is really what we saw that they were actors and they were not waiting to react and we had wonderful worldwide initiative peer to peer to provide mental health support to raise awareness of communities not only online but also on in uh, offline on caravan you know regarding educating the other raising awareness of the other claiming for and i think this really important but not only providing uh, services currently you have also many surveys that highlight what are the proposal and how they see you know the response to the pandemic as a kind of positive moment and strong moment to review and to reassess and it will be uh, just to make a link with uh, uh, Yasmin regarding the education what means education and the last report done by plan on girls you know and they did a wonderful 
project, how they see education. It's not only about schooling, it's also about empowering, it's about child participation. Is it school open, to, you know, on its environment? It's the link between school and also vocational training and life projects and uh, skills empowerment. It's about also life cycle approach, investing. I think really very, and I want to, what we need to not only listen, but to learn about all this initiative and to make sure that they are part of the solution. What, 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 and I think it's been said a lot already by, by Alison and Ajat and others. But when we start seeing now reports coming in from Somalia, Colombia, Uganda, from our colleagues who are out there working in UNICEF, in Save the Children, in so many different NGOs uh, of children who are actually already returned to school. Thanks to the measures that have been undertaken with the investments that we were able to make from education and art to aid. Uh, and they are able to go in classrooms with bigger social distancing possibilities, with masks, with sanitations, with teachers being trained. Um, we are seeing that it is possible to keep schools open during a crisis, including COVID-19. All that is needed is funding and very committed colleagues on the ground in the NGO community, in the UN community, and of course the political will of the government. It's possible. We just need the funding. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yasmin, and everyone, Roberta, Alison, Yasmin, Najat, Cornelius, for your advocacy, for your words here, but also the work that you do outside to, to help protect children um, as, a, as a global community. Mm -hmm.